Welcome back. Let's listen to Gilgamesh's fifth dream. Okay, ready? This is from the tablet in ancient Chadubum. Tell Harmal. Tell means spring, I think. Or Ain. Anyway. My friend, I had a dream. How ominous it was. How desolate. How unclear. I had taken me hold of a bull from the wild. As it clove the ground with its bellows, the clouds of dust it raised thrust deep in the sky, and I, in front of it, leaned myself forward. Taking hold of, enclosed my arms, he extricated me by force. My cheek, my, he gave me water to drink from his water skin. The god, my friend, we are going against, he's not the wild bull, he's different altogether. The wild bull you saw was shining Shamhash. He will grasp our hands in a time of peril. So we, um, we skipped the thing that says Ankadu. Ankadu told him it was okay. All right, so Gilgamesh's dream, the word salad bit. Taking hold of enclosed my arms, he extricated me by force, my cheek, my... He gave me water to drink from his water skin. And then Ankadu says, The god, my friend, you are going against. He's not the wild bull, he's different altogether. The wild bull you saw was shining Shamhash. He will grasp our hands in time of peril. Indeed, he's going to grasp our hands in time of peril. We'll see about that. I don't think that's going to happen. Do you think that's going to happen? No, but Ankadu thinks it is. <laughs> I, it's nice when your hands get grasped in times of peril. I, it's a good thing. I, I like it when when my friends grasp my hands when I'm in peril. It's nice. Um, but Shamhash, he's not going to come through. I just don't think so. The one who gave you water to drink from his skin was your god who respects you, the divine Lugalbanda. We shall join forces and do something unique, a feat that has never been in the land. When the Tablet 4 resumes, the heroes have almost reached the Forest of Cedar. And Ankudu is giving Gilgamesh courage. All right, so we repeated the five dreams, and now we're almost at the Forest of Cedar. Have courage, Gilgamesh. Why, my friend, do your tears flow? Oh, offshoot sprung from Uruk's mists. Do now stand, and Gilgamesh the king, offshoot from Uruk's mists. Not mist, midst. M-I-D-S-T. Uruk's midst. Shamhash heard what he had spoken. Straight away from the sky there he cried out. Shamhash heard what he had spoken. Straight away from the sky there he cried out a voice. Hurry and stand against him. Humbaba must not enter his forest. He must not go down to the grove. He must not. Shamhash heard what he had spoken. Straight away from the sky he cried out a voice. Hurry, stand against him. Sham Humbaba must not enter his forest. He must not go down to the grove. He must not. Shamhas wants them to kill Humbaba. He must not wrap himself in his seven cloaks. Once he is wrapped in six, he has shed they like a fierce wild bull, horns locked. His seven cloaks. So I don't know if we'll get to expand upon this anymore. He must not wrap himself in his seven cloaks. So this is a really ancient theme that you see today in, in those modern New Agey pictures of the seven chakras. Um, but it's spread all throughout the world, this, this, this concept of, of seven gates, or seven chakras, seven levels of energy. Um, you know, there's seven colors in the rainbow, that's probably a big part of, of it. Um, it seems like it comes from Tibet. That seems to be the origination of it, or at least that's what Marcel Eliade indicated to me when I read Eliade's History of Mythology in Tibet. There's, that seems to be the, the nexus of it, but from that region, sort of eastern China, say, also like Kazakhstan and all that, that, that it's the, the Indo-European, um, Indo-Iranian, rather, area. Um, this idea of seven levels of magical energy spread far and wide. So it spread all the way to Mesopotamia here. If, it, if, it, if indeed it started from somewhere in Tibet, it could be, you know, much, much older and, and much more diffuse. Uh, but you see it, you see it in Mesopotamian religion, you also see it in, in Hopi religion. I was reading a book of the Hopi where they have a chakra system that's, that's exactly identical to the Tibetan chakra system, uh, except the Hopi have lost two. Interestingly enough, you lose two, they just didn't need them, they threw them away. But the other five map to five of the, of the Hindu chakra system. So, of course, you see it in the Indian subcontinent. And so it's, a, it's an interesting and widely dispersed mythological theme. Uh, so it's cool to see it here, his, his seven cloaks. Anyway, I don't know if we'll hear any more about his seven cloaks, but I just wanted to add that historical tidbit. Um, he must not wrap himself in his seven cloaks. Once he is wrapped in six, he has shed they like a fierce bull, horns locked. 
he bellowed once, below, full of terror, the guardian of the forest was bellowing, whom Baba was thundering like the god of storm. Oh man, Gilgamesh is... Oh man, whom Baba's thundering like the god of the storm, like Yahweh, like Zeus, thunder! Okay, long lacuna, then... Ankudu opened his mouth to speak, saying to Gilgamesh, We have come down, and my arms grow stiff. Gilgamesh opened his mouth to speak, saying to Ankudu, Why, my friend, do we speak like weaklings? Was it not we who crossed all of the mountains? Did not before us, before we withdrew, my friend experienced in, comment, in, my friend experienced in combat who battle you and you fear not, like a dervish and change. Let your shout resound like a kettle drum. Let the stiffness leave your arms, the tremors leave your knees. So they're in Lebanon, they're in the cedar forest, and, and Ankudu's arms are just, they're stiff, he can't fight with them. <coughs> Alright, let's keep going. <coughs> Take my hand, friend, and we shall go on together. Let your thoughts dwell on combat. Forget death and seek life. Careful man. Let him who goes first be on guard for himself and bring his comrade to safety. It is they made, it is they made a name for days long in the future. And the distant, the two men, and, and at the, at the distant, the two men, I'm sorry about reading this. <laughs> At the distance, the two of them arrived. They ceased their talking and came to a halt. Let's do that one more time because it's the last part of this tablet. Let him who goes first be on guard for himself and bring his comrade to safety. It is they made a name for days long in the future. At the distance, the two of them arrived. They ceased their talking and came to a halt. And next we will do tablet five, the combat with Mbaba. <clears throat> ah, but before we do tablet five in the combat with Humbaba, you'll see there's many more minutes on this video, probably at least three. Um, let's let's talk about let's talk about tablet four. I think tablet four is really interesting. There's all this really beautiful imagery. You know, his 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 breath and what is it? His his mouth is fire. His breath is death. Um, and the um the repetitions. So let's, there, there was that theme that I started in the beginning of reading this tablet, you know, what's, what's the purpose of repetition in something like this? Um, but right now I want to take a moment to think about uh, what, what is the purpose of dream ritual? You know, what, what would the meaning have been for someone in Gilgamesh's time, you know, a, a, a royal person who, who has the fate of a large number of people uh, at his disposal or under his responsibility. What would it mean for a royal person to be engaging in feats of heroism like this? And and what would they get from paying attention to their dreams? You know, dreams are really funny things. Uh, you know, you, you can sort of think of this whole epic of Gilgamesh as a kind of dream, uh, you know, a collective dream that that humanity was dreaming then and, and is still dreaming now. You know, we still have this text. It doesn't really read like a story, certainly not like a history, and not even like a narrative story, but it's kind of like a dream. Like you, there are, in, there are motifs in dreams that come back over and over, and I'm not sure what I'm trying to say here. Mostly I'm just asking a question. I'm curious what you think about dreams and, and the significance, or the relationship between dreams and mythology. Uh, you know, Carl Jung had a lot to say about that, but um, I'm curious what you have to say, because he's an old dead white man. Um, yeah, so what is, what is the, the significance of climbing up a mountain and building a hut and putting a circle in the hut? You know, what's, what's the, the circle, right? You, know, every, you do this five times, you, you sleep in the circle, and the god comes to you in a dream and tells you what's going to happen. You know, what what is the role of dreaming in our life? Um, you know, clearly for Gilgamesh's life, it was very, it was a really visceral part of his life, an important part of his life, and, and it wasn't so segregated from reality. You know, like they're on this venture to, to kill a monster, and of course he's going to dream every night and, and, and consider those dreams to be an integral part of the reality of the situation that he's in, because they are. Um, and I don't think we give our dreams very much credit anymore because they're dreams, right? They're not real, they're not physical. Um, but 
clearly they have a profound impact on, on who we are and, and how we internalize the world, how we understand the world. Um, yeah, so dreams are important and, and I think it's particularly relevant that uh, dreams feature so heavily in, in this piece of mythology because dreams are mythology. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was Tablet 4. Um, for things in the comments to think about. What, what is the role of dreams? And what is the role of repetition? And what is the role of repetition in dreams? And what is the role of mythology? Those were my questions for you today. Alright, uh, I will read Tablet 5 in the future time. Future times. I'll see you later. Goodbye.